Well, Pastor Newton, if I miss my flight, it certainly is not your fault. You are precision driven in your coordination this morning of our worship service. Thank you for not only managing our, our clock and our worship service, but also for the great leadership you provide for the Tallahassee community. To my good friend, Pastor Suarez, God bless you for great leadership. You talked about me like a dog in this pulpit. You said my classmates were, I'll never forget you, man. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You said something like that, and I forgive you because you did it with such class. But I do want you to know, uh, keep my mic up, please, to help those in New York tonight. I don't want to be hoarse when I get there. Thank you for your support. Um, I... I know you call me old, but I, and I, you're right, I am old. I'm much older than you might think that I am. Uh, I know you're looking at me, you're saying, wow, he's old? It's just, it's just die, just die. <laughs> might as well be truthful since I'm in church, right? <laughs> I want to address uh, this community with the affirmation that certainly is due you for the consummate demonstration of unity and your commitment to the same that brings this community together. And I'm so very, very happy, Pastor Newton and Pastor Suarez and all concerned, Pastor Ricardo, who's not here today, uh, certainly would be if he could, but something critical prompts him to not be here that I've, that's been brought to my attention. However, I am so excited that you've asked me to come two years in a row. I mean, you know, this is huge. I mean, either you all are running out of choices for speakers um, or I really messed up last time and you want to give me a second chance. Whatever the issues are, I just say thank you for whatever. Uh, you know, one of the, um, Elder, uh, one of the um, wonderful experiences I had in this church was um, uh, I was here once and uh, many years ago, I forgot who the pastor was. Who was the pastor then? I forgot. Was it her? Right. Maybe Herman Davis or something. Robinson? Yes. But anyway, when I was here, at the time you all were lifting the tithes and the offerings, there was a dancing deacon. He, was, he would, you know, do the electric slide while he was lifting. And that thing stayed on my head. I had nightmares about that. I just loved it. I never forget. I, I, and I've been drawn to this church ever since. I said, now this is the happening church here. Not only because it's a university town and we have some great leaders and I have wonderful friends here, but you got some deacons who they can throw down. They can cut some rug while while they're lifting the tithes and the offerings. So this is a special church in my heart. And thank you for the opportunity just to share with you today. I want to talk to you about a subject as couched in the book of Daniel, chapter 4. And if you have your Bibles, I ask you to direct, direct your focus there. Daniel, chapter 4. And I will read from the King James Version, verses 34 to the end, which I believe is verse 37. The Bible says in verse 34 of Daniel chapter 4, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom. And excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are true, that his ways judgment. 
and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Permit me for just a few moments to preach on the subject, the crisis of egotism. Let us pray. For the next few moments, Heavenly Father, this is not about a preacher. It's about you, and we ask that you would take absolute control. Thank you, Lord, for using a feeble instrument like me. I ask now that despite me, you will speak to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. In my imagination, I hear feet that are running. The sound of the feet is somewhat muffled, as if the person moving has on Reeboks or Converse's or Nike's soft-soled shoes. But it's evident in the ear of my imagination that whoever it is that's moving, they're moving swiftly. They're running. You can almost hear the panic in their feet. Now, as if an unseen camera is panning back and forth in a movie to give a fuller view, I see the whole person who is running. The person is robed in the fine garment of the royal ballet of the king of Babylon. His face is contorted in an expression of horror. His mouth is moving, but nothing is coming out. You get the feeling he would scream if he could just get it out. It is a nightmare he has beheld. He says to himself, if I could just wake up, and so he bites his bottom lip so hard that his own blood is the taste that pervades his mouth. What is it, I ask? What is it that has created this scene? It is some time after 570 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar has been ruling Babylon for approximately 40 years. The kingdom of Babylon, incidentally, is the superpower of the Middle Eastern world. The city of Babylon has reached the point in its beauty and size where it's considered to be the kingdom of gold. The famous hanging gardens built for Nebuchadnezzar's Persian wife are still considered in the year 2016 as one of the seven wonders of the world. You need to know that Nebuchadnezzar in this context is a senior citizen now. He's got his AARP card. His son, Nabonidus, is already being trained for the throne for almost 40 years. The faithful valet, the faithful servant of the king, Nebuchadnezzar, has served his master from the days of the king's rise to power and the days of conquering to the subtle days of prosperity and relative peace. This valet, every morning, has gone into the royal apartments, past the palace guards, into the inner chambers where the king sleeps. The valet, the servant, was proud that he was the first each morning to see the royal presence and awaken the royal majesty and hold out to him the golden bowl with water for the king to dip his hands and refresh his face before the royal bath. This morning, he's just like any other, he thinks, he made his usual trek past the guards into the inner chambers where only the royal valet and a select few were allowed to go. But this time, to his surprise, when he gets to the king's huge bedroom, he did not hear the even breathing of the king. And when he pulled back the curtain from around the royal bed, his majesty was not there. Now, this valet, like any typical bureaucrat, is unsettled by anything that does not follow the normal plan. And while he's gathering his thoughts, he begins to realize that there's some kind of a sound, a grunting sound coming from the private side of the king's bedroom that faces the outside where the private gardens abide. Suspiciously, he moves now toward the porch that overlooks the garden closer now. He is sure there are sounds, strange sounds, and then he gets a full view. He sees it. It is a sight that will be etched in his mind forever, like letters carved in Grecian marble. Something half human, half beast, 
is draped in the king's sleeping garments. It's on his hands and knees. Face resembles the king. But when this monster turns to look in the direction of the servant, there is grass clinging to the beard and oozing from the mouth. It is a river of slobber. The mouth moves up and down like an ox chewing its cud, and the face is dominated now by eyes that have the vacant look of insanity. It is the king, but it's not the king. It's half a man and half a beast, and the royal valet, the royal servant, drops the golden bowl and runs shouting for help. The king has become a beast. My subject, the crisis of egotism. I wonder, though, I wonder, what are the issues in this chapter? When you read chapter 4, it almost appears to be a royal proclamation. Look at the beginning of chapter 4 of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar to the peoples and nations and men of every language, of every language, who live in all the world. May you prosper greatly. It is pleasure, verse 2, to tell you, to tell you, about the signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. You need to know something before I go any further. You need to know something. This chapter, this chapter 4 of Daniel, is Nebuchadnezzar's personal confession of his own rebellion and conversion. You need to be aware that the entire book of Daniel was written by Daniel. Except, listen carefully, the entire book of Daniel was written by Daniel, except... Chapter 4, did you all know that? Chapter 4 was not written by Daniel. Chapter 4 was written by Nebuchadnezzar. It's the king's personal confession of his own rebellion and conversion. You need to know, written by the king, it tells of an experience that many higher critics still denounce as myth. But there is evidence. Listen carefully, there is evidence that late in his life something did happen to Nebuchadnezzar. There is evidence that Nabonidus became the vice regent before Nebuchadnezzar actually died. There is evidence that this was out of custom. There is evidence that shows a gap in the record of Nebuchadnezzar's accomplishments. For several years toward the end of his reign, it is not surprising that the actual facts, hear me now, of the king's insanity do not appear in the royal records. This was not commonly done. Negatives, in other words, were not put into the records of ancient heathen rulers. And his counselors, who depended upon him for power, would not want it known that one so powerful and so feared was not in possession of his own mind. And there is one more point. Daniel was one of those counselors. He had interpreted the dream that appears in Daniel 4. He'd been right before, so they waited to see now if the thing would really come to pass as the Hebrews suggested. Walk with me, for in the vision of this entire chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar saw a tree, and the tree was giant, and it covered the earth, and the birds and the animals, according to chapter 4, and the men found nurture there. And then he saw something in the dream, something from heaven come down and command that the tree be cut down. But the Bible says in the same context, there was a watcher, a voice that said, cut it down, but save the roots. Save the roots. In the meantime, you need to understand this chapter, I reiterate, is Nebuchadnezzar's own confession and record of what happens when God's grace is ignored and spurned? But it is also the record of and reminder of how far, listen to me, how far God will stretch himself to save just one human being. Now, you all can sit there calmly if you want to, but I'm going to tell you, God will stretch himself to save just one human being. He will go to any unalterable, unexplainable lengths just to get your carcass into glory. And the day you take that for granted is the day you're in serious trouble. Because I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it, since I don't live here, none of us is worth saving. 
And I continue to argue, I continue to argue that the most simple thing for God to have done to solve the sin problem was to wipe out Adam and Eve. Get rid of the human race. Come up with another creature and move on. Let me say it this way. You better be glad I wasn't God because I would have done it. But thank God, only God is God. You see, God has got this incessant, unexplainable, this determined, pursuing fixation with human beings. He's got this idea in his divine brain that we ought to be in heaven with him. Thank you, Father. We are the most messing up folk in the universe. Any place we go, I want you to know, as human beings, we mess up. I was reading Time magazine. It said that we even left trash on the moon. But God made up his mind to save. So how did he work? That's what this sermon is about. What did he do to try to save Nebuchadnezzar? Let's go to chapter 4, verses 4 through 27. Chapter 4. Since I have to get out of here, I'm going to sum these things up. Number one, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Sees himself as a tree. Troubled by the dream, sends for help. He's made some spiritual progress, number four, because he acknowledges the special gifts of Daniel through Daniel's God. Look at verse 8. Finally, Daniel came into my presence and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar, which is the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. Nebuchadnezzar, watch this, has begun by chapter 4. You need to get this. Nebuchadnezzar has begun by chapter 4 to recognize something special going on in Daniel. I've got to ask you, since I'm visiting now, I've got to ask you. It's the job of a guest preacher to ask you nuisance questions. I need to ask you, do the people that you work with and rub shoulders with, have they ever noticed that there is anything special about you? Does your life and your faith cause them to ask questions as to why you don't laugh at the same old dirty jokes or engage in the evil speaking of one another, as to why you don't drink the same thing, as to why you don't act the same way? Do you raise questions in people's minds by your life? I'm not talking about sporting around with the Bible under your arm on Sabbath morning trying to look holy. I'm talking about consistently being a normal, dependable Christian. Can you say amen? amen? He was beginning to notice something special about Daniel. You notice when he had his dream in Daniel, stay with me. You notice when he had his dream in Daniel chapter 2, he didn't even summon Daniel. But in chapter 4, he sins for the man who has the spirit of the gods inside of him. Fifthly, he tells what he dreamt. Verses 10 through 17. He recognizes the presence of the heavenly intelligence in the dream. Look at verse 13. In the visions I saw while lying in my bed, I looked and there was a messenger, a holy one. Now remember, 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 in chapter 3, what did Nebuchadnezzar see in the fiery furnace in chapter 3? Hang with me. He has seen God. He has seen God. So in chapter 4, he recognizes that there is a Holy One present. In chapter 4, you need to get this, we're getting to a point where this heathen is beginning to recognize that there's something up there bigger than he is. Ladies and gentlemen of my faith today, one of the most significant points in your journey, in your spiritual life, is when you recognize that God is bigger than you are. He recognizes it. Daniel is disturbed, seventhly, by the dream because he knows it's not good news for Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 19. But as you do, please understand that Daniel is no fool. Daniel has been working for Nebuchadnezzar a long time, and he knows that you don't just go trooping into Nebuchadnezzar's throne room to give him bad news. Remember when Daniel told him in Daniel 2 that his kingdom was going to end? Then Nebuchadnezzar came back in chapter 3 and tried to recreate the image so his kingdom would never end. So Daniel, watch this, he sees the dream. He recognizes it. He knows that Nebuchadnezzar is going to get cut down by God, and he's trying to figure out some nice way to break it down to him. Verse 19, then Daniel also called Belteshazzar was greatly perplexed for a time. In other words, how do I explain this? And the Bible says his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Daniel, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Daniel answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. He breaks it down now. The tree you saw. And then he describes the tree. Verse 22, you king are that tree. 
Daniel interprets the dream and then he makes a strong appeal. Look at verses 26 and 27. The command to leave the stump of the tree with his roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Somebody's got to get this thing today. The blessings, listen to me somebody, the blessings will come to your life when you finally accept the fact that God rules. Somebody still didn't get it. There are blessings we don't get. There are blessings we don't receive because we've not yet decided that God is smarter than we are. We still have these plans. We still have these ideas that we can just get God to understand how smart we are and how many degrees we've got and agree with us and work out our plans for us. But God is still trying to get us to understand that our vision is limited. We see now, he sees forever. When you recognize God rules, your kingdom will be restored. Then look at verse 27. Look at this strong appeal. Look at verse 27. Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sin. Do what, everybody? Renounce your sin by doing what? By doing righteousness. You know, folks, I've really come to believe that we make some problems more complicated than they really need to be. Listen to me, somebody, please. You're in a mess today? Are you, are you kind of frustrated with some things going on in life today? You're in a mess? Just start doing what's right. I'll say it again for you. If you're in a mess, if your life is confused, one of the best ways out is to start doing what is right. But no, we want to kind of fix it up and butter it up and work out some angle pathway to right. And your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed, it may be that then your prosperity will continue. Now, here's what I want to say. The first, you need to get this part. Because if you get this next statement, this chapter makes sense. The first three chapters, hear me clearly. I like to teach as I preach the word of God. The first three chapters of Daniel, listen carefully. The first three chapters of Daniel describe God's gradual effort in trying to save Nebuchadnezzar. In chapter 1, remember the chapter 1 when the boys wouldn't eat the food? Remember that? Come on, talk to me somebody. Remember they went 10 days eating pinto beans and oatmeal and brown rice and, and granola and sprouts and tofu? Remember that? Then later on, Nebuchadnezzar found out that these boys who stuck with God did what he said. Forgive me for getting excited. Stood by God because I'm kind of hungry. I want to get a meal, but I can't eat. All right. Turned out to be 10 times smarter than everybody else. Do you remember that? At the end of the chapter, Nebuchadnezzar interviewed these boys. He said, I've not seen anything like this in microbiology and trigonometry and chemistry, organic chemistry. These are 4.0 students. These are outstanding. These are valedictorians. These are summa cum laude folks. Never seen anything like this before. And he was suddenly confronted. Hear me now. Listen, for those who are participants in Christian education and supporters of the same, he was suddenly confronted, listen to me, church, with what the knowledge of God can do for God's people. He faced it. He faced it. And God was reaching out to Nebuchadnezzar saying, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, there is a knowledge. There is a knowledge greater than human knowledge. There is a knowledge greater than secular knowledge. There's a church school knowledge. There's a knowledge of the word, Nebuchadnezzar, and he had to think about that. Then in chapter 2, God comes back again. Remember chapter 2, the vision of the great image? Talk to me, somebody. You remember that? God unfolded to Nebuchadnezzar all the things that would happen. Nebuchadnezzar was so impressed. Let's read his own words. Let's go to chapter 2. Let's read his own words. These are his own words at the end of chapter 2, verse 46. Daniel had explained the vision, laid it out, and Nebuchadnezzar just impressed. Watch this. Then came Nebuchadnezzar and fell prostrate before Daniel. What's going on here? The king falls before a subject. Paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. He's now offering sacrifices to Daniel. The king said to Daniel, surely, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Now, please, folk, let me point something out. Every, listen carefully, every time God moves in your life, 
Got to say that slowly. Every time God moves in your life and reveals truth and opens your mind to more understanding. So anybody hear me? Every time God does that, then he has the right to require more of you. See, truth isn't just good news. It's a great responsibility. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, because of Daniel 2, you know there is a God of gods who can reveal mysteries. And you see, each time God reveals himself to you, now this is not going to make you real happy. It's going to make you a little nervous. Each time God reveals himself to you and gives you more truth, it means the next time he comes around, the next test he puts you through, is going to be greater than the last one. Because now you know more than you did before. The Nebuchadnezzar gives this great confession. Great confession. You know, it's a funny thing, folks. Human nature. When we are in trouble and we get out of it, you know, we have these great testimonies that we like to give. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. God saw me through. God gave me the check right on the day I needed it. God went before me and he straightened my evil boss out and we testify. Hallelujah. We lift holy hands. We wiggle our hips out of joint in the praise team. And when, until the next time, when trouble comes, and then we boo-hoo-hoo all the way down to the dumps, we forget so quickly what God has done in the past. But remember, the same God who brought you through before is ready to bring you through more abundantly the next time. All right, Nebuchadnezzar, now you know that he is a God of gods. Then, watch this, I'm chronicling, watch this. Then chapter 3, go to chapter 3, chapter 3. In chapter 3, God really reveals himself. You remember the great image? The three fellows wouldn't bow down on the plain of Dura, and Nebuchadnezzar puts them in the fiery furnace. When they get into the furnace, how many people are in the furnace? Four, not three. Nebuchadnezzar says, I see someone, and it looks like the Son of God. And when the men come out of the furnace, they have no smell of charcoal or smoke. They have no smell of anything burned or tattered. They, their clothes are just, are, they smell like old spice. They smell like Fahrenheit for men. Clothes are not tattered. They're fine. Now look at Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 3. Look at what he says. Look at what Nebuchadnezzar says, verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar says, praise be to the God of Shadrach. Meshach and Abednego. Now look at the progress he's made in chapter 2. When Daniel gives him the vision, he bows down to Daniel. But in chapter 3, he says, no, no. Praise be to the God of these Hebrews. What's going on? He now recognizes God. They trusted in him. They defied the king's command. They were willing to give up their lives rather than worship a God other than their own God. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces. What's going on? He's now reached the point now where he's saying to these Hebrews, I like your faith. You ever heard that before? Now, really, have you? I've heard that before. Pastor, you ever heard that? Adventists are good people. I like your church. I hear it on the airplanes and I'm talking to bishops and people are, or, or people of other professions. I like your church. I like what you all stand for. You all have a good youth program. Not claiming it for himself now, but he does like it. Sabbath's a great idea. You ought to keep it. I like the fact that you all have a health message and you don't eat certain stuff. That's good. Keep on eating it like Mikey. I love your church. You're a wonderful people. Folk, let me say something. We can't charm God. God is not interested in us liking the Bible and liking the truth. The only thing that satisfies God is when the truth becomes a part of our lives. So he's reached the point now. So by the time you get to chapter 4, of which I preach today, God is saying to Nebuchadnezzar, hey man, I don't want your compliments. I want you. And so, the tree. And so, the tree. And so, the tree. Go, if you will, now to Daniel 4, verses 28 and 29. All of this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later. He reveals the interpretation of the vision of the dream through Daniel because he refuses to acknowledge God. Then he gives Nebuchadnezzar a whole year. 
If you're sleeping right now, you better wake up. Come on, folk, wake up now. He tells them trouble's coming. And then he holds off for a whole year. A whole year to pray. A whole year to confess. A whole year to break it off. A whole year to repent. A whole year to straighten things out. I'm going to have to deal with you, Nebuchadnezzar, but I don't want to. I'm going to give you a year. I got to be real blunt with this congregation now. How many times has God spoken to you about the same thing over and over again? How many times must you sit there and hear his voice and know that things are not right and not respond? The Bible asks it a different way. How long? Halt ye between two opinions. If God be God, then serve him a whole year. He forgot about the dream. You know, he forgot about the dream. You know, when he first got the dream, he was nervous. He was afraid. You know how we are when we hear a good sermon. I'm serious. We go out all troubled. Oh, Lord, Pastor Ron, you spoke to me today, Lord. Jesus, you spoke to me. You snot, you know, you, you, you're crying and stuff coming out of your nose and and you're getting it on the lapel of the suit of the preacher and, and the little mascara and the little rouge and stuff is all. I got to get it dry clean. Sometimes it doesn't even come out. I'm going to go home. I'm going to clean it up. I'm going to straighten it out. Thank you, Lord, for talking to me today. You even hug the preacher when he leaves. You spoke to my heart. Triple eyes all watered. You go home. You don't even turn on the television. You just start throwing out stuff. Throwing out magazines and CDs. Pious. But he waited a year. See, God's no fool, folk. You need to hear me. He knows human beings. And he wants the real thing. You know, Jesus is a master psychologist. He understands life. God's not looking for emotionalism. God's not looking for some temporary feeling of goodness. It's time to straighten it all out. What do you say, folk? Time to get serious about our religion. A whole year he waited. All kinds of time. Pastor, at least two weeks of prayer. You know, spring and a fall. At least 55 or so prayer meetings. Crack it. At least four more quarterlies. Hear me? Look at verse, the next verse. Verse 29, watch this, 12 months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, now, this is Nebuchadnezzar, is this not the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and by the honor of my majesty? Look at the next verse, verse 30. The words were still on his lips when a voice from heaven says, this is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. And even as God talked, Nebuchadnezzar began to change. He was out on the porch of the garden that morning, bragging, boasting about how much vegetarian meat he's eaten. Bragging and boasting about how early he got to church and he never missed an early morning prayer meeting or Sabbath school, boasting about his own righteousness and goodness. Let me suggest to you something to you, folk. It is an insult to God for any Christian to ever declare him or herself righteous. If it's anything good about you, it's because God is. I know I'm the president of this church in the Southern Hemisphere of the United States, but let me tell you something, folks. I get tired of even Seventh-day Adventist Christians who have their long list of Sabbaths kept and tithes paid, and chocolates eaten, and all the things we've done for the Lord. God's not concerned about any list. He's concerned with whether you've come to the point where you recognize that only God deserves the glory. Yes, Sabbath ought to be kept. Yes, tithe ought to be returned. Yes, you ought to eat right, but these things are not brownie points to heaven. They do not make you any better than the Baptist or the Presbyterian. The only thing that qualifies you for eternal life is that you are in love with God and you prostrate yourself daily giving him the glory is this not I 
Is this not the great Babylon that I have built? And while the words were on his lips, his fingernails began to grow. His hair began to change. His mind began to go blank. Let me tell you something. Just in case you've got an MD or a PhD or a JD, you can't think a decent thought without God. You can't get up in the morning and take a step without God. Come on and talk to me, somebody. You can't remember your phone number without God. God said, I'm sick of this. You had a year. I love you, Neb. I got to deal with you, man. I love you, Neb. But I've got to deal with you. He turned into a beast. This isn't all of us, you know. You know the beast? Oh, I'm sorry. I should have told you earlier. You know what the beast is? And some of you really thought, and it's probably my fault. I didn't explain it clearly. You probably thought this was Nebuchadnezzar's problem. You know what the beast is? The beast is spelled E-G-O. Self-dependence. Self-reliance. Self-glory. You see, the glory of Christianity is it brings a man or a woman to a point where you are forever hesitant to giving yourself credit for anything but accepting Jesus. You know, I have a bio that's online that was read, but let me tell you something, folks. The only smart thing about me is that I've accepted Jesus. That's all I deserve any credit for. And the beast can come out. I'm going to make a statement. Before God can save you, Listen to me, before God can save you. Sometimes he has to bring you to the point where you can see just how bad you can be. And folks, let me tell you, that thing can be shocking and humiliating. That's why I always shudder. I'm serious. I've been through a few things I can't tell you all about today because time is short. But I've been through a few things and I always shudder when I'm talking to a Christian and they're telling me about somebody else's mistakes. And they often preamble it with this, Pastor, I would never do that. Noah never thought he'd be a drunkard. Moses never thought he'd be a murderer. David never thought he'd be a liar, an adulterer, and a murderer. The Bible says it this way, take heed, lest when you think you fall down, that's when you think you stand, you fall down. Sometimes the Lord has to strip away the curtain, strip away the seat, strip away the posture, strip away the position, strip away the title, strip away the reputation, and leave you just hanging out there, and you recognize I've discovered, that I've discovered, under those circumstances, you recognize in living clear technicolor, that there is nothing good in you. And in those moments, folk, I want to tell you, that does not have to be the end. That can be the beginning. You know why? Yes, because when you come to church now, you've got a whole different attitude. You're not worried about what you've got on. You don't care what they think. You know, one of the most marvelous things, you know, it's not good to have bad things happen to you. But I'll tell you one thing that is good about bad things happening to you, and that is to be released to be totally released from the opinion of others. You see, one thing you're free of now, you get to the place where you say, I don't care what anybody thinks of me because whatever you think of me, I already think worse and I know more and I've accepted the fact that I can do anything bad or terrible. But by the grace of God, I can rise from it. So you can't mess with me now. You can't talk about me now. You can't make me feel bad now because I already know. The dream said, save the roots. Now, maybe there's a theologian in here. Perhaps Pastor Lenny, maybe you or Pastor Suarez can can kind of help me out to understand this text. I don't really understand it. Seven years, man, eating grass. They protected him. Now, let me show you something. Let me show you how good God is. What I don't understand here. God protected that rascal for seven years. Kept his kingdom intact for him. Come on and talk to me, somebody. Guarded him. Save the roots. That's my point. It is not the purpose of God, ladies and gentlemen, to embarrass anybody. 
It is not the purpose of God to humiliate you when you don't have any reparation ability and recuperative power. It is not the purpose of God to destroy anyone. The problem is that sometimes there is so much self in the way that the Lord has to cut us all the way down to where we got started. You can say what you want about a baby, but a baby has no pride. Anybody who slobbers and messes all over himself can have no pride. Come on now, babies ain't got no pride. When they're hungry, they cry. When they feel like pooping, they just poop wherever they are. They have no pride. God says, I've got to take you back. I've got to take you back to your roots. I've got to bring you back to a point where you recognize, pardon my nomenclature, you ain't nothing, didn't come from nothing, gonna be nothing unless I help you. I've got to reduce you so that you'll look to me and pray for me and ask for my help. You don't trust yourself getting out of your bed, getting behind a steering wheel and busy traffic on any morning. God says, Un until you have time with me, I've got to fix you. Sometimes the church must address you about your behavior or your attitudes. You might reply, I'm not subjecting myself to the church for this. They're all sinners like me. I ain't going to take that from nobody. Folk, who are you? Folk, when are we going to come to the point of recognizing that we are nothing? Keep my mic up, please. And God is everything. I wonder if you hear what I'm trying to say to you today. He took everything away. Nebuchadnezzar couldn't even take care of his bodily needs. Can you see him? That valet, that servant for seven years, bathing him, shaving him, cleaning him, wiping him, while his vacant oxen-like eyes looked into space. Well, my closing text here, you might be familiar with it. I've used it many times, Isaiah 54. Now, this is a text that has gotten Ron Smith through some very difficult days. Wish I had time to tell you. I'm going to tell you a little bit. Sixteen years ago, I was suddenly stricken because of an injury. It's not a lifestyle, because of an injury with a stroke. I was crippled. Couldn't walk. Couldn't write my name. You're talking to a guy who used to dunk a basketball backwards. I was afraid to step down that step, to walk off a curb. I had to wear a bib. I thought I was cool. I had a big afro. I thought I was cool. I couldn't write my own name. Couldn't use a fork. Somebody had to help me eat. Somebody had to help me to go to the bathroom. I'm a grown man. I was passing one of the largest churches in North America. Had doctors behind my name. Had other career options and paths. But the Lord stopped me in my tracks. My ego was out of control. I'm testifying now, so don't be pointing a finger at me. Ilana, somebody needed to cut me down to size. God seized the opportunity. And I sat there looking out the window in a wheelchair after all the friends had stopped coming. I used to be popular, center of attraction. Folks stopped coming by. Phone calls, stop. Wife gone back to work, kids gone to school. There I sat with a whole lot of time with nothing to do but to think about what was. Couldn't walk. Beautiful car, couldn't drive it. Food and refrigerator, couldn't get it myself. Couldn't even make it to the bathroom until somebody helped me. I started remembering as I looked out of that window, every senior citizen I never visited. What? Does it profit a person to gain stuff, degrees, and jobs, houses, and cars, and land, and you lose what's most important? Then I began to pray, Lord, is this it? Really? Will you give me one more chance? Right in the middle of my prayer, I said, Lord, if you can just let me know whether it's over for me. Lord, I think I figured this thing out. There's too much of me in the way. Lord, I promise to give you the glory. Lord, I, I'm sorry. I profusely apologize and beg Jesus for another chance. I was 42 years old. That was 16 years ago. You can kind of do the math. Let me tell you something. The phone rang right in the middle of that prayer. I didn't anticipate it. 
It was Elder Ted Wilson, the president of the General Conference. He was then the president of the Review and Herald Publishing Association. And he extended to me an opportunity, which I really heard. I was listening to Ted's voice, but I was hearing God's voice. The Lord had to let me know that day that he wasn't done with me yet. And let me tell you something, folks. He raised me up. He's given me another chance to have some dignity. Somebody better hear me today. My ego was out of, was out of control. God cut me down to size. It took me two years to learn how to walk again. Are you listening to me? Two years to learn how to take care of myself in the bathroom. Two years to do the basic stuff to have dignity. God gave me a shot. But let me tell you something, folks. God has raised me up. And if I could do the holy dance up here like that deacon and get away with it, I would right now. I'm as happy as a bird sucking on a beech nut tree. God has raised me up. He's given me another chance. I don't take medication to live. I run five miles a day. I help people who are infirmed and insipid in their ability to ambulate. God has given me a second shot. And he's blessed me in ways I could never imagine. But it's different now. God did it. Not I. But Christ. But you know, you're going to go through some rough times. Isaiah 54, 7. You're going to go through some rough times. Listen, for a brief moment, Isaiah says, God is talking here. He's talking to you. For a brief moment, I abandoned you. It's my text that has gotten me through stuff. For a brief moment, I abandoned you. But with deep compassion, I'm reading Isaiah 54, 7 for the purpose of the screen. Isaiah 54, 7. For a brief moment, I abandoned you. But with deep compassion, I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you. But just for a moment, with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, saith the Lord, my Redeemer. Sometimes you got to come down hard, folk, because we just won't get it. We just won't surrender ourselves totally. We keep on playing the half-stepping game. God says, Ron, you're going to feel like I felt. You're going to have to suffer some persecution. You're going to feel like my son felt on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Have you ever been there? No, really, have you ever been there? Chastised? Humiliated? Cut down? You know, God has always cut a people down in order to help them. Look at the Israelites. They were chased by the Egyptians, attacked by the Amalekites, spurned by the Canaanites, captured by the Ammonites, afflicted by the Philistines, led into captivity by the Assyrians, exiled by the Babylonians, tortured by the Moabites, dominated by the Persians, subjugated by the Macedonians, restricted by the Greeks, oppressed by the Romans, killed by the Germans, and yet today, Jewish folk are some of the most resourceful and determined people I know. Folk, you know something? If it wasn't one problem, it was another. Somebody knows what it means to be humbled, to be cut down. Somebody here knows what it means to be displaced, disrupted, disabled, disliked, disadvantaged, disinherited, dispossessed, disenfranchised, disowned, Dishonored, disdained, dismayed, dismissed, discounted, discouraged, dislocated, disappointed, dislodged, just dissed, cut down. The world means it for evil, but God, I don't care what happens to you, can use it for good. When all of our suffering is over. When all of our trials are past, when all of our tears are wiped dry, one day we're going to be like pure gold, purified and beautified, magnified and glorified, justified and sanctified, satisfied and lactified, edified, fortified, glorified, dignified. We will say, here I am through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Sometimes the doctor might declare, listen to me as I'm closing, my musician can help me to close this thing on out, just play softly. Sometimes the doctor might declare that you will never get well. The diagnosis might be that you will never see again or walk again. The tumor might be malignant. 
the license might be lost. The house might foreclose. The career might be over. The car might be repossessed. The divorce might be final. People you love might die. And it's under those circumstances, listen to me somebody, that you honestly begin to wonder, does God care? Has he forgotten me? Is there really a balm in Gilead? Has it run dry? Does God even notice how much I'm suffering? From personal experience, I'm here to tell you, in your darkest moment, when you are a product of your own mistakes, I still declare to you, oh yes, he cares. And his heart is touched by your suffering and your grief. I see him, I really do, I see him right now in Genesis the great God of the universe. He doesn't need a creation to get his hands dirty. He doesn't need to stoop by an unnamed stream. He's already proven what he could do. When he claps his hands, there's light. When he calls, the trees jump forth. At the will of his mind, the birds of the air and the beasts suddenly appear. But for you and for me, he stooped. Divine knees got dirty. Divine fingernails became clogged with clay beneath them as he step by step formed our nostrils and our high brow, then leaned his clean face next to our dirty one made of the dust of the ground and breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. Please don't tell me that it's over. It's not over. It's not the end. Your hardship, your financial misfortune or reversal, your health issue, your relationship issue is not the end. God still, Nebuchadnezzar, you're cut down. But I'm going to bring you back. And Nebuchadnezzar testified. He says, I've got more power now than I had before. My kingdom is greater now than it was before. Watch this. But he talked differently. He says, it's because God did it. The beast of ego, the beast of resistance, the beast of self that allows you to sit in church Sabbath after Sabbath and hear appeals that cut across your life and you make no change. God says, I can't leave you on your course. I love you. I've got to find some way to get you into glory. I've got to deal with you. I'm going to break you down. And then I'm going to restore you. And oh, can he restore. Let me tell you, my God can restore. And when he restores, I don't care if you wasted 80% of your life's resources. Looks are gone. Health is gone. Money is gone. Friends are gone. Resources are gone. 80% of your life gone. All you got is 20% left. God said, give me what you got. Keep my mic up, please. Give me that 20%. And I'll do more with that 20% than you could have done with 100%. Give me a shot at your broken, dilapidated life. I'll show you how I can restore. I can make something out of nothing. What is Jesus after all? Is he just a hematologist when you've got a blood disorder? What is Jesus after all? Is he just a cardiologist when you've got a bad heart? What is Jesus after all? Is he just a good passenger when you've got a sinking boat? Is he just a grocer when you've got some hungry folk? I'm glad he's that. But thank God he's more. Somebody has said when you don't have a job, he's the best employment agent in the universe. Ah, oh, when you don't have a friend, I declare to you when folks stop coming by, he's the best friend you could ever find. Ah, oh, I've got good news for you. Watch this one. When you mess up and you've done something terrible and you're embarrassed and you can't show your face, I declare to you, he's a robe to cover your shame. He's Adam's redeemed. He's Abraham's sacrifice. He's Isaac's hope. 
He's Jeremiah's bones of fire. He's Amos's justice. He's Hosea's love. He's Micah's mercy. He's Esther's determination. I say it this way. He's my bread when I'm hungry. He's my water when I'm thirsty. When I get down to my last dime, he steps right in on time. Somebody has said, he's my sacrifice. He's my priest pleading for my atonement. He's my Shekinah that lights the dark way. He's the veil through which I reach God. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the Savior for any sinner who wants salvation. He's intercessor supreme. He's mediator, redeemer, restorer, the fairest of 10,000. That's enough. I surrender my ego, my plans, whatever resourcefulness I think I've got, I, I surrender it to Jesus. I lay it at his feet and I declare God, not me, but you are king of all. That's my declaration today. If it's yours, I invite you to stand to your feet. I need to do something before I leave. I'm sorry, folk, but I need to declare, I need to declare this carpet in the middle aisle or any aisle that you can get to outside of your pew as an urgent care center, as a divine emergency room. Somebody here is having a serious medical issue. I know we're living in an age of HIPAA laws. We can't discuss specificities, but it might be a cancer, a growth, a tumor. Maybe it's malignant. I don't know. Maybe your blood has come back challenged from your lipid panel and revelatory of cholesterol problems. Or maybe your, 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 your diabetes screening test has come back indicative of the fact that your sugar is out of whack. I want to give you an opportunity now. I'm going to ask those doors to stay closed. It's only a, uh, just take your exit and, and keep them closed. And ushers, help me out with that, please, because I'm making an appeal now. I don't like energy going towards the back. I need energy coming towards the front. I don't know. Maybe you've got a medical challenge of some sort. Step down front. I want to pray for you before you leave today. Before you leave today, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you before you leave today. You're praying for a child. You're praying for a parent. You're praying for somebody you love. I don't want you to leave with this monkey on your back. That's right. Just step, just step down. You want to get some support. If God can raise me from a stroke, if he could heal blind Bontimaeus, if he can raise a woman who was sick for 12 long years, God can fix any problem medically. Medical science's extremity is God's opportunity. My second appeal. Somebody's having some financial woes today. Business out of whack, you know, business upside down, house upside down, credit card debt. I don't know what it is, but it's a challenge. You might want to come to the urgent care center to step into the carpet against the wall on either side, in the center aisle, in the side aisles, to step out, to step down. God can fix your business. Unemployed, need a job, underemployed, overemployed. Give it to Jesus today. Lord, anoint my business, anoint my practice, anoint my, anoint my educational journey. There's some young person here today who might be the product of bullying. Step into the urgent care center. Somebody has a spiritual journey. Step into the urgent care center, an addiction of some sort. Maybe a marriage, a relationship that's strained, a relationship on the job, a relationship at the church, in the community. I don't know. But you need that relationship fixed. He's a wonderful counselor. He fixes stuff. He fixes people. He tweaks dynamics and relationships and he restores them. He can restore them. Bring that family, that relationship. Bring your loved one to the altar right now to pray. Let God fix it. Don't leave here without getting this fixed. I'm going to pray for you now. Heavenly Father. In the name of Jesus, I come to you today on behalf of your people who have stepped out. You've designated a special place for us to step. And Lord, we followed your instruction. And now, Lord, somebody's medical issue that can't get articulated individually, person to person, but they, 
They know along with their treating professionals what it is. Their medications are revelatory that they're being treated. Lord, whatever the problems are, diabetes, COPD, heart disease, epilepsy, neurological disorders, hematological disorders. Lord, any category that I may have missed, asthma, upper respiratory. Oh, God, I pray right now that you will address and fix medical stuff. Turn it around, oh God. You did it for a Syrophoenician woman. You did it for the woman who touched the hem of your garment. You did it for blind Bontimaeus, for the man by the pool of Bethesda. Oh God, you even raised Jairus' daughter. Lord, you raised me up. You did it for me. So people are asking you now, Lord, can you help? Can you please help us, Lord? Help somebody today with a medical challenge. Secondly, Lord, there are some relationship problems at this altar. Marriages that are strained, relationships that are troubled, work relationships, community relationships, father to daughter, daughter to father, mother to son, son to mother, Lord, husband to wife, member to pastor, pupil to principal, teacher to principal. Oh, God, fix relationships. And then, Lord, I pray in a very special way that you will fix somebody's business, somebody's financial woes. Whatever shape or form they are in, I pray that you will just address them, Lord, according to your wisdom, to your riches and glory, and your timing. Fix somebody's job. Fix somebody's management of money. Fix somebody's stewardship financially. Oh, God, I just pray that you will restore somebody's business. Oh, God, open up a door. Somebody who's upside down, put them right side up according to your plan. Oh, God, in your name, I beg that you will fix somebody's business. And then, Lord, there are some spiritual issues in the forms of addiction and hardships. And relationships and affairs and all kinds of stuff, Lord, that we could never mention. But, Lord, you know. Lord, can you emancipate us, please? Can you give us freedom from that stuff, please? Oh, God, somebody's calling on you privately right now, Lord, at the urgent care center. Oh, God, please intervene in our health matters, in our business matters. And our relationship matters and our spiritual matters. God, come through for us as you always do. And let it be, I pray, in the name of Jesus and for his name's sake. Amen. Folk, before you go back to your seats, I need you to do something now. I'm not trying to change this into anything theatrical. God knows I'm talking from my heart as God prompts me to talk to you. Right now, you're going to have to claim what God has already done for you. So I want you to raise your hand right now and lift it to heaven and say, Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It is done. God bless you, folks, as we go back to our seats. I'm Pastor Leonard Newton III, and I just wanted to take a minute and let you know how glad I am that you shared in this hour of worship and Bible teaching with us. We hope that you were touched and truly blessed. This message was brought to you by the support of the Maranatha Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Tallahassee, Florida. We thank God because it's through the support of the congregation, viewers, and listeners like you that we are able to spread this word to the world. We would greatly appreciate your prayers and your support. We want you to know that any and all donations, small or great, are sincerely welcome. To contact us or to give a donation, please visit MaranathaSDA.org. That's MaranathaSDA.org. And if you are ever in the Tallahassee area, come out and worship with us. Thank you.